Well, here we are, Joe, season two and uh, rolling out into 2021. So I guess it's a little bit late. We're starting here in February, but uh, looks like the gopher um, or the groundhog, excuse me, uh, gopher. Hey, that's uh, the thing about Minnesota, right? Uh, the groundhog <laughs> saw uh, his shadow yesterday. So six more more weeks of winter. And I saw that it was actually snowing there in, in Punxsutawney, but uh, what a great, uh, what a great movie uh, groundhog day. I think 2020 was kind of groundhog day. How about you? Same here, man. Um, 20 years old, that movie. Wow. Uh, it just seems like yesterday to me. Um, I'm up at our uh, mountain property uh, this week and uh, we had some snow flurries uh, and it's, it was cold. It was in the twenties this morning. Um, and you know, I, from Minnesota, i think we're getting a little bit of feedback joe you're in you're in the mountains probably a, a good remote spot so yeah i might actually turn off my video just to see if that helps yeah uh, if you want to uh, again there's a little bit uh you know the mountain air was was hitting your mic there so if you don't mind repeating kind of what you what you mentioned there about 2020 you know that movie right uh, of groundhog day oh yeah it, it, that movie was uh, a classic for sure and it's hard for me to believe it's 20 years old already uh and uh yeah at the i'm up in the mountains as we talked about and it's been uh it's been especially cold and windy we had 50 mile an hour gusts up here uh so you know lots of trees down and uh uh, fortunately, our our property seems to be holding up, but we're we're inside a metal tent, as my wife calls it. Uh, we've got our <laughs> eight by twenty shipping container that we had outfitted with electricity. We have a well, and so it's not exactly like you know roughing it too bad. But uh, yeah, it's been good. Um, yeah, since we last talked, Mike, uh, I uh, my wife and I were um, participants in the Moderna vaccine trials, and so I found out a few weeks ago that I was. Uh, I was actually vaccinated last September. So pretty exciting for us. It kind of makes you relax a little bit, but we're still, you know, wearing masks and social distancing and hand washing and all those things you're supposed to do. So it's been, uh, it's been interesting. Uh, it changes your attitude a little bit, but not your behavior. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you for, for doing that. Right. Cause that lay, lays the groundwork for, yeah. for helping so many others here in the country. So thank, thanks for paying it forward. Like, like you always do. Uh, what's the one thing for 2021 as you or 2020, as you reflect uh, on last year, what's the one thing that uh, kind of stuck out to you as you look at technology from us, from your C, your CIO hat? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I've described it as the second pandemic, which is the cybersecurity pandemic. I mean, the cyber criminal activity um, in, is just off the charts. Uh, and I, and I think, uh, you know, that combined with uh, work patterns, so pe more people working from home and creating complexities around, you know, identity access and management and uh, you know, just just keeping pace with all of that. And at the same time, businesses are trying to stay afloat and, and operate in, in unique and different ways. So I think this has been a year of change. And then yesterday, what Bezos announces, he's stepping down as CEO, that freaked me out. I didn't ex expect that so soon. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting year uh, for sure. Uh, hopefully a year of recovery. 40% growth. I mean, he wiped out the Sears catalog. So uh, good, good, <laughs> good for him, I guess. And did, you know, digital talk about digital transformation for Sears. I'm sure Sears wish they would have done that themselves. So as you, you know, I know you've got a, an article that just came out, out today um, and we'll, we'll let folks read that. But as you've got your crystal ball, what are, what are you thinking about in 2021? Well, I, I think it's um, a, a year of, uh, you know, enterprise risk management and cybersecurity becoming more of a team sport inside companies. It, historically, it's been viewed as uh, an IT thing. And I, I see more and more, uh, especially in the firms that I'm interacting with, that that um, enlightened view of the world um, is starting to uh, uh, improve. I, I, I'm hopeful that that's the case. I still struggle with many C-suite execs where you have to convince them to think about it and spend time on it. But I think, you know, we're making progress on that front. The article is uh, the top 10 trends that I see in cyber. Um, I'm sure that uh, our guest today could add a couple more, <laughs> ah. but uh, good stuff. Perfect. Well, hey, perfect transition. So, hey, season two, would you mind uh, introducing our, our guest for today's show? Yeah, we're thrilled to have Max Everett on. Uh, he's a, a longtime cybersecurity professional and new to Charlotte. He's had a very fascinating career. Um, he spent time, uh, first of all, he's got his own consulting firm 
at Novum Consulting, where he's there full time now. Um, he's also been the CIO of the Republican National Convention. He's actually done a couple of different tours of duty there. Um, he was the CIO of the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, he was CIO of the White House as well, and has had a very storied career. And we're delighted to have you on, Max. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. Yeah, I'd love to just start off um, just asking you, uh, you know, kind of how you ended up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, I, I got pulled down here, uh, as you've mentioned before, I, I've worked on a few too many uh, national political conventions. Um, and so I was the, the vice president and the CIO for the convention here in Charlotte. Um, the, the, you know, the, in some ways, the convention that wasn't, although we did the business of the convention, obviously with COVID, um, it didn't look anything like we've done before. I've, I've had a role in conventions going back to 2000 um, on the technology side. Um, I spent more time on this one doing um, pandemic protocol planning than technology probably. Um, but, but some of those same principles I learned doing that, you know, and I think you talked about the most important thing, which is risk management. Um, really, that's what most of the, you know, once you know the, the basic rules of the road, it's about risk management. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that. But um, having done these before, sort of as a consultant, um, you know, I was in Cleveland and flew back and forth. And when, when this came up and I was asked to come down, um, my wife made very clear that it was going to be either the whole family came or nobody came. And so um, we were fortunate. We have two little girls that are they're on the young side. And so we, uh, we moved down to Charlotte. Um, and we loved it so much here that we decided to stay. Um, so we, we put down roots and we've, uh, we, we just got into a townhouse here in uh, December. And so we're, uh, we're, we're in it to win it here in Charlotte now. Yeah, it's a great city. Uh, you know, Mike and I were just talking uh, uh, with you earlier. I mean, none of us are from Charlotte originally, but how many, how many years uh, does it take, Mike, before you're considered a native Charlottean? Uh, uh, shoot, about 20 years ago, it was one year. Now, I don't know, it might, might be a couple more, <laughs> but uh, looks like, Max, you've got a background with, with Texas and, and Austin. Talk about a place that's growing leaps and bounds. You, by the time you buy a house, you might be uh, in a different state, practically, right? If you're if you're in Austin, what do you what are you hearing from your friends in the, in the Austin, Texas area? That place is growing like crazy, huh? I, yeah, I've got a good group of friends. I I, I see them every year. Obviously, I'm not going to get to see them this year, but um, I mean, Austin is you know I, I was in school in Austin, and then I lived there for about three years after school, and you know as I've gone back over the last 20 years. Um, you had hit a point where it's in some ways, it's still a great town, but in some ways you couldn't recognize it. There were so many cranes and buildings downtown. And, um, and of course, as you watch your friends start to move farther and farther outside, uh, you know, now the places that were out there were literally pasture and longhorns uh, grazing. Uh, they're now big subdivisions. And so it's, it's the, the, grow, the growing pains have been a challenge for Austin. Uh, I mean, again, it's a great town. You just have so much opportunity with the school and, and the culture and things, but um, it, it's been for them the, the traffic and all the things that come with that growth. I mean, and Charlotte's been through that too. It's also one of the biggest growing cities. Um, and so you see those, those challenges of traffic and things that are just, they're tough. Yeah, traffic yeah. definitely changes when you have a lot of people move. And then especially with COVID times where not everybody's on the road. So if you're, I'm sure you're checking out a house or a spot, hey, this is gonna be great, but then, then you probably have the California effect of like, okay, great. What time do I have to wake up to kind of get the kids to school or, uh, you know, to their ball games. So uh, I'm sure it changes the, the commute strategy uh, pretty frequently, but Hey, work from home, I guess you're, you're closer to school and, and hopefully those, uh, those sporting events are, you know, after school activities, if they're still going on. So. I'm actually looking forward to being in traffic again. <laughs> going to some place of business. <laughs> it's, you know, um, the biggest traffic, uh, you know, that you ha run into now is the coffee pot in the house. You know, it's like a, you know, <laughs> a line there. Um, Max, I'd love to get your um, your uh, story. How did you find your uh, start in cybersecurity? How did that happen? So, uh, you know, mine was uh, a winding road. Um, I, I was, you know, I had always sort of been a geek growing up and played with computers. I got you know, my parents got me an Apple IIc. Um, so I remember, you know, messing around with the Apple IIc. Um, I was fortunate in high school. My high school was one of the first ones in Texas with a networked computer lab. Um, and so uh, I got a good bit of exposure and then sort of kept that up even in college a little bit. And then I went to law school. And while I was in law school, it was mid-90s. 
right as the internet, of course, is happening. And so um, as I became commercialized, and so when I got out of law school, I went back to Austin and I ended up working for a firm, uh, this firm that basically does legislative tracking for all the lobbyists and, and companies and different groups in the news. And so um, they were just moving everything they did online. And so I ended up working with them as they move things online. I ended up working with, you know, a lot of the clients didn't have, as you can imagine, the late 90s, a lot of smaller places, they didn't have anybody technical at all. And so I would end up going in and helping them, you know, how do I even turn my computer on? How do I use the internet? Um, ended up doing a lot of that and really just enjoyed it. Um, and then happened to, uh, got onto President Bush's campaign in 99 there in Austin. Um, and so by the end of that, I was essentially running the, running the network, you know, the, all of our network for them. And, you know, we got people flying all over the country and, and state offices. And so I really just sort of got immersed in that, but really enjoyed it. And it, the customer service part and the problem solving pieces of it. Um, and so I went to DC, like many people think, and I'll go for a couple of years. And, you know, before we came here, it had been 20 years, pretty close to 20 years in DC. And as I was around there, as I started working my way up and, and moving more into management of technology, uh, I got into places like the White House and Department of Energy and Homeland Security, where uh, you know it wasn't just technology anymore. The security became more and more the forefront. Um, you can imagine the sort of the sort of threats and, and the pace of operations that we saw at places like the White House and uh, Homeland Security, and, and certainly when I was at Energy, and so. That was really how I, I started getting into that. And that's frankly where my legal background helped um, because a lot of full, you know, one of the things you, you learn to think about in law school is about, you know, risk. Um, it's sort of a high level. And, and to me, and Joe, you said it when you were talking before, that, that transition of people understanding that, you know, cyber, there is a tactical part of cybersecurity, do, you know, doing the things, um, but cybersecurity as a whole is it's a risk conversation. And it looks different for every organization, every place. Um, I happen to have been in some places that were very high risk, right? They had a very low risk tolerance um, and because of what they did and the information they stored. Um, and so that really helped me get a, a great perspective on, um, you know, and I think back when I was at the White House, you can imagine the, the pace of work at the White House, the kind of people you typically have working in any White House uh, right, they're working 24-7. Um, they're always on all the time. Um, and of course, technology has only fed that. And so their desire and demand to be constantly tied in um, runs right into that being one of the highest risk places on the planet, right? There's virtually no country in the world that doesn't want to get into your email at the White House to see what you're talking about and thinking about. And so how you balance that um, making sure people could get their work done in such a high-paced environment and balancing out the huge threat that you had um, really for me was it was great because it was such a challenge and for me it really gave me a perspective of cybersecurity um, as a customer service question right which sounds sort of silly um, you know but I used to joke with people when I was at energy um, you know I, I've already got I'm already fighting the Chinese and the Russians um, I can't fight my customers. And so the reality is if, if you're not doing customer service, if you're not giving people a way to do their job, they're going to fight you, it's human nature. They're not being malicious about it, but they have a job to get done. And so, um, so I think that's one thing that helped me was really trying to have that customer service mentality as I thought about cybersecurity. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, what it must have been like. I mean, I imagine you didn't sleep uh, during your tenure at the White House. Uh, and, you know, that was a, a time that I look back fondly, uh, you know, <laughs> given our current political climate. I, I don't know what it would be like to be in, in, in the White House these days, especially the last four years uh, with uh, all the craziness that's been happening there. Um, you know, I'd love to get your take on uh, what you see in terms of major trends in cyber, uh, you know, through your travels. What are you seeing um, big picture wise? Well, I think, uh, you know, one, obviously, that's on the tip of everybody's tongue, of course, is solar winds, um, which for most of us was not, it's not surprising it happened. It's only, you know, it's surprising how shocked some people are. Um, you know, in fact, we've had some different supply chain type attacks the last couple of years. Um, you think of the Russians with Mount Pecha and some other things where they didn't do it as broadly and as U.S. focused. 
Um, but you had a couple of those things happen the last few years. And so it really was no surprise that there was this supply chain oriented attack, um, right? Because you know, all, the, all the smarter bad guys in nation states, um, you know, we've gotten a little better at our frontline defenses, you know, sort of building the moat and the wall. And so they're all looking for a way to start from the inside out, um, which really is, it's what solar winds was. And so, um, and as a lot of us who've been through cybersecurity over the years, we've seen, you're gonna have the pendulum swing and now everybody's gonna spend the next year talking us about supply chain risk and those type of things, um, which is good. But of course it also means that there are probably other things they need to be thinking about that may not get covered. Um, you know, one of them, again, you mentioned to me has been the long-term struggle to get people thinking about cybersecurity as risk management, right? It's not simply buying a firewall or buying, you know, whatever, whatever broke or got hacked yesterday, I just buy a new one and I'm fixed. That's of course not the case. It's I'm constantly, you know, and, and again, if you talk to boards and, and executives, most of them understand and think about financial risk. Right, they're used to that nomenclature, but they haven't really thought about it from a cyber perspective. Right, it's a long-term, ongoing, and it changes all the time. It changes on based on what I do, and it changes based on what my adversaries do, and even knowing who my adversaries might be. And so, I think that's really one of the other um, changes I do hope happens this year, uh, because there have been out people talking about this more and thinking about it. Of how do we change the conversation to risk management? Right, so. Uh, you know, Bank of America is going to have a very, very different risk management, you know, approach and measurement than a small savings and loan, um, you know, not to mention, you know, a manufacturer or a utility or anybody else. And so we've got to find a way that really meets all those different people where they are in managing their risk. So I, I think that's going to be um, pretty extraordinary. And of course, I think as we look, as, as people are just peeling the onion back on solar winds, um, understanding how they were able to be so persistent for so long. Um, I'm thinking and hoping, and I've talked to a few companies even the last month or two who are trying to think of different ways to, to better understand and, and better look at you know, your risk profile within your network and your systems. Um, I think that's, you know, again, many of the, I mean, you think about the companies that got hit here, right? Um, and again, I will tell you, any federal government, I mean, some of us had pretty, pretty good and sophisticated systems. We had a lot of the tools in place. Um, you look at some of the private sector companies and obviously we haven't begun to heard all the names of the different private sector companies that were hit by this. Many of them had a tremendous number of tools. They had capable people and they still miss this. And so understanding why that was the case, I think is important. Um, you know, clearly one answer, it's not just the tools, uh, right? The, you know, I used to, again, when I've done this before and talked to people, you know, I used to joke, if you've ever walked into a SOC and talked to people who work there, I've never met somebody at a SOC who said their problem was they didn't have enough information, right? Most of them typically had three or four overlapping sets of tools. The problem was how in the world could they go through all this data and information they're getting and all these different alerts from their tools? How do they triage, right? Unfortunately, even the biggest, best SOCs today are still really, they're a triage operation. Right, it's simple, you walk in and there's a hundred things on your list. How do you line up the top 10 and start working through them um, and hope that you're not missing that one important flag that was down here at number 95? Um, that, that's what I've seen with a lot of socks over the years. And I think there are really some good, smart people and entrepreneurs that are starting to think of tools that will help people sort of shortcut that line, right? How do I really know, you know, I may only have a couple people working in my sock. How do I really get the most important thing in front of their eyeballs today? Um, I, I do think there's going to be some, hopefully, some traction on that this year with some different tools and and, and probably just a different look at how we're how we're managing our security process as a whole. Yeah, AI, machine learning uh, solutions are starting to show up uh, with you know endpoint security platforms, email protection systems, and that sort of thing. I'm seeing that. I'm sure you're seeing that too. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I think uh, you mentioned something that sticks with me too. And this whole notion of third party risk management seems to be on the radar. That's one of the top 10 things I mentioned in the Heller report uh, that's out tomorrow. And, uh, you know, you see um, uh, platforms like uh, BitSight uh, gaining in popularity because, oh, and CM, CMMC too is now 
asking organizations that provide services to the federal government to look at their third party risk management profiles. And, and it used to be, you know, less of an issue, but now it's uh, uh, it's much more acute and heightened. Um, what, what would uh, what should companies be doing that they're not doing today in your in your thoughts? Uh, well, one is, I think, again, having that level and again, uh, you know, mentioning there are some companies that are doing this very well. But I think having a level of risk management, visibility and capability at the board level, if you're a publicly traded company, and I know many companies are starting to move that direction, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's uniform, especially across some of the biggest ones, right? They'll have some people that are really have true expertise in managing, um, you know, risk within their product and sector or financial risk or regulatory risk. I don't think a lot of them still have really good expertise at the board level on a regular basis on managing cybersecurity risk, which really cuts across all those different areas. So I, I think that's got to improve. Um, I think that you know promoting the executive, certainly the CIO and the CISO within the organization at an operational level, right? Meaning it's not, you know, you still have companies, unfortunately, that don't have a CIO and CISO, good sized companies. Um, and now it's not just that you need to have those, they need to be executives, right? They need to be in the executive management team. They need to be sitting and meeting regularly with the CEO, uh, with the CFO, who typically is somebody who's very regularly engaged in that risk management process for a company. Because of course, you know, look, the, the biggest risk for every company is you're spending more money than you're taking in, right? That if you're, if you're a private sector company, that's your number one risk. Um, so CFOs and those folks, um, they have long built fairly sophisticated, you know, systems and processes to measure and manage that risk. Um, but cybersecurity is starting to cut into that, right? Because it impacts your bottom line. Um, it can impact, you know, as, as somebody like SolarWinds knows, you know, you can imagine they're taking an enormous hit with many of their customers. Um, if you're not measuring that risk, you don't have a holistic risk picture. And so I think those are a couple of the big ones. I think to your point, Joe, uh, getting those new tools in, you know, AI, uh, machine learning, and those pieces, those are going to automate a lot of the tasks and tools that are going on. Um, you know, I would mention again customer service, and what I mean by that is um, when folks talk about IT modernization, we spent a lot of time on that um, when I was at Department of Energy and in government. Uh, to me, part of that means it's not just getting a new system; it's getting a new system. Uh, or improve systems that are aligned to what your customers need, right? Whether that's your internal customers or your external ones, um, right? So if you're building really good customer service oriented systems, um, that's going to cut your support load. It's going to make it easier for people to do the right thing in terms of securing themselves. Um, it's going to cut out shadow IT, uh, which is obviously a big way that, that you know, bad actors are getting into companies. Uh, so I think that's actually one that um, and of course, that's going to align with what we saw in 2020, which was telework. You know, there's, there is no organization on the planet that did not have to do some work last year to, um, to build out their ability to do telework and work from home. Um, and that's great news. Um, but again, all of us understand because they had to do that so quickly, um, it's almost inevitable that they probably didn't do all the steps they needed to do to secure all of these new platforms they built, all these new things they've done. Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of retrenchment this year on companies that rushed out to the cloud, rushed out to new tools. They're going to have to go back and, and, and look at the implementation and the ongoing support to make sure those were done in a secure way. Um, I, I think that's probably one of my big concerns that I think you're going to see this year. Um, and again, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of moving to cloud. Uh, we made a lot of strides at the Department of Energy moving to the cloud. Um, but most people who have gone to the cloud realize it's not you now just going to the cloud or even picking one or more platforms. You've got to have all the tools to manage the cloud, right? There's financial tools, there's operational tools um, that give you that visibility and control of what you're doing in the cloud. Um, I think you're going to see some big growth. And of course, there have been some really good companies over the last year that have built some, some tools around that. And so I think you're going to see a, a dramatic expansion in those tools as well. Yeah, I've got a I quick think... question. Uh, Joe, got a quick, quick, quick question. Because we're in the we're in the you know, public sector, but we do do stuff with uh, DoD and CMMC. 
what was kind of interesting um, at the end of tail end of last year, just being in cyber, and I don't know how many people really picked up on this, but there was a new bureau, there's a new bureau out there, uh, the Bureau of Cybersecurity and Emerging Technologies, it's being called CSET. Based on, you know, your knowledge and your experience, what, what Joe and I typically see is if the government does something, it will be trickle down, right? A lot of things will trickle down from that. So what's kind of what do you think might be kind of the short-term impact of, of the new, you know, cybersecurity emerging technologies? And what do you think may, maybe the long-term impact might be? Again, I know there's new administration that maybe that department changes and goes away or whatever, but uh, you know, what are, what are some of your thoughts on the short-term and long-term impacts of that, that new uh, bureau? Well, I think that with that and some other pieces, I will tell you when I was, you know, when I was in government and I, and I know the folks right now, I think, because many of the, most of the cybersecurity professionals in government, they're career employees, right? So they're there between administrations. Um, they're, they're focused on protecting the country. And so what I would tell you is I think um, they're very aware and very focused on the idea that the federal government is one of the largest buyers of technology. If we go a direction, we can move the market. Um, and, and we really tried to make, um, for a couple of years there, the federal CIO and, and a lot of the larger departments, we really tried to focus on making those things and being more strategic. One of those challenges in federal government is everybody just goes and buys whatever they want, yeah. right? It's, a, it's these layers of how appropriations work um, and authorities and different things. And so there was a lot of push to say, look, we're, if we're all buying, you know, the, you know, if we're all buying something in Amazon, if we're all buying Office 365, yeah. we need to be doing it together. We'll get a better price. Yeah. We can push for some particular controls and things Right, so if you look at FedRAMP as a great example of that, um, you know, which was a push for people to do um, certain level of controls if they were gonna do business with the government. Um, there's challenges to FedRAMP. It is a slow process, um, I would tell you, but it's been a good one. And it's actually helped companies start to think about, and for the most part, they're typically going to reflect the controls they do for FedRAMP eventually even into their commercial offerings. So I think that's a, that's a big help. And, and that's where things like CSET, and some of the other tools. Um, I was on a call last week with some of the folks who were very instrumental in putting CMMC together, right? The uh, DOD and the defense industrial base, uh, things just like we saw with solar winds, they've seen these for years. Um, and they knew that, you know, as some of the larger companies started sort of locking things down, the, the bad actors simply went the next level below, right? And I, and I actually worked with some private sector clients who were going through the early versions of things like CMMC in which you had to go through and say, are you doing these things, right? Are you taking these steps? Because all of us understand that, you know, that, that chain is your security, right? And so they're simply going to go until they find the weak link. You know, we all think all the way back to Target, right? When Target got hacked, how did they get in? They got in through, you know, everybody, you know, almost everybody in cyber can tell you this by rote. They got in through the air conditioning vendor in Pennsylvania, uh, right? And so, um, that's really the mindset that was behind things like CMMC. And, the, and listen, I've talked to the guys who did that. They know it's not perfect. Um, and, and people can absolutely fall back and use that for compliance. Um, that's not what the CMMC folks wanted. That's not what any of us want, but it does help us set the bar. It does help us say, you got to at least be doing this. If you're not, you know, you're opening the door for everybody else to come in through you. And and so CSET and some of the other things and some of the work that they're doing at, at CISA, at Homeland Security, that's really what they're focused on is let's, let's at least set a bar. The bar, the low yeah. bar is not good enough, <laughs> but some people aren't even doing the low bar. And, and, and the seatbelts aren't even on, right? Sometimes the seatbelt's <laughs> not even on and they're just driving down the highway and you're like, yeah, you know, you have a really good chance just putting the seatbelt on, right? I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, you're so right. I think, um, I've said this many times, but digital transformation is not an IT thing anymore. It's a C-suite thing. It's re revamping and rethinking their expectations around risk and cyber and, and, uh, and technology. It's, it's not a, it's not an IT department thing anymore. And the sooner uh, we all get that, the, the more progress we'll make uh, on the cyber front. Um, you know, there's so many different frameworks out there, Max. Uh, you know, Mike and I engage with companies all the time and they're confused about, do I do ISO? Do I do NIST 53171 CMMC? You know, wh which, which one of these platforms do, do you advise uh, people per pursue? You know, I, I, and I would honestly tell you, we, we change it, you know, and, and having done private sector work, we did it differently for all sorts of people, right? And again, it goes to that risk management piece. 
look, if you're if you're a multinational, if you're one, if you're a publicly traded, you know, Fortune 1000, you know, those are the kind of companies to be looking at stuff like ISO and things like that. Um, you know, if you're doing any work with the government or, you know, whether it's state, local or federal, um, I think a lot of them are starting to look at NIST because that's starting to become sort of a de facto standard. Um, and obviously, having been in government, I've I've read NIST till my eyes glazed over. Um, and and there and there's value with NIST, but you know, as when we were in government, we used to go through. And if you go through NIST, actually, you can tailor your controls in there, right? And, and in fact, that's you know, fifty three one seventy one's for that. And so, right. And the reason for that is because the professionals understand that you mitigate risk different ways. And what I do, you know. When I was Department of Energy, we did a lot of work, as you would expect, with the energy sector. Um, and they have some very unique requirements, as you can imagine, for their operational technology that, that's keeping our lights on right now. Um, and so, and that was always a challenge to sort of keep up with it. But they had very different requirements. Um, and, you, and you couldn't necessarily do NIST the same way with them because it looked a little bit different. And so that one's one, I mean, even just frankly, like the CIS, the top 20. Right. I, I would tell you that having done private sector work for different entities, very often walking in the door, we would start with the top 20. We would just go through the top 20 because for the majority of those folks, they probably had improvements just out of the top 20 that would immediately improve their risk framework. Um, and so I, I think there are easy starting points. And look, if you're going to a small company, they're not publicly traded, they got you know a small team, um, that's actually reasonable for them to do. And if they're actually at least doing some elements of those top 20, they're in awfully good shape, uh, right? And depending on their risk level, they may be in great shape. Um, and so I think that's one thing that we've tried to focus on. But but I've also, Joe, worked with, you know, like you, with the companies that because of what they do and because of who their customers are, they're going to have to do this. They're going to have to do other things. And I think, you know, one of the frustrations for them is how do you map those controls, right? Um, you know, and I saw that with one or two clients and I saw that with, you know, working with the energy sector, they would be following, you know, they've got certain things they have to do under FERC, um, right? They have the requirements that are there. Uh, for, FERC is basically who sets the standards for, for example, all the electrical uh, systems. And they would be doing those very well. And then for the ones who had to do with the federal folks like me, I would walk in and now they have to remap all those same things they're doing to NIST, which looks slightly different. Right, they're mostly the same things, but the wording and things are different. Um, I know that's been a challenge that we've got to figure out just to reduce the overhead and compliance cost for people. How do we make that, you know, there's never a one size fits all, but how do we make that a little easier for them? Uh, we spent a lot of time doing that just to make it so people weren't having to do the same work three times, right? Or they're spending money on cybersecurity staff who are literally just, they're spreadsheet jockeys, right? All they're doing is checking boxes on Excel sheets to make someone else happy there in compliance, but they're not actively adding to your risk management. Um, I think that's one that that still needs some work, right? And that's at the federal level and, and with different groups. And, um, and again, there's progress being made there, um, but that's sort of how we've typically approached that. Yeah, makes sense to me. I, I've, uh, I'm working with one client, uh, a fairly large organization, um, more billion or more dollars in revenue. And what, what I've been focusing with them on is this notion of uh, enterprise risk, cyber enablement, and business units sort of all working. If you can imagine three gears, all of those things need to work together. And uh, the, the really neat thing that I've seen evolve there is the CISO there, the, you know, what I would consider the CISO there, as well as the cyber ops team really work effectively together in a way that I haven't seen at very many companies. And, and they almost don't care which NIST framework or ISO framework they're using or CMMC, they've gotten themselves CMMC level three certified, not while they haven't been certain, nobody's done that yet, but, <laughs> but there, the idea is that there's a, a really strong and tight relationship. There's a lot of collaboration. It's not an us and them. And now uh, trying to elevate that to enterprise risk um, and, and get that dialogue has been the biggest challenge, but you know, something that we'll, we'll get, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do one way or the other because the market will force us to do it. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, I'd love to get, uh, just shifting gears a little bit, just, you know, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the Republican convention and the White House. Just, you know, if you, if you think back on those experiences, what are some of the, 
you know, big takeaways. I'm sure you can't talk about some of the details. You're probably still, uh, you know, classified information, but what, what are some of the, you know, more unique experiences that those of us who've not spent any time in those government situations, what, what, what can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, the White House, as you can imagine, is, and, and more of mine of the White House is, is PTSD versus actual classified. <laughs> I can't talk about, I'll, I'll get the shakes here, but uh, yeah, yeah the, the White House, again, is, I think one of the big things there is, uh, well, you know, I've told a story to people, so I, you know, I worked on the transition in 2000, and I, and I still remember, I, I walked into a meeting, it's December of 2000, and I walk in a meeting with some of the White House staff and some of the folks from um from GSA or helping us in the transition process. And, and a person walks in the room, uh, one of the White House staff, and he's kind of hangdog. And I kind of look at him like, oh, bad day. Uh, and he shakes his head and I was like, what's going on? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we, we've got a, a network outage in the East Wing. I'm like, oh man, uh, you know, how long has that been going? You know, I'm figuring it's been a couple of hours. It's, it's like, it's been four days. Oh, geez. They were, so in the East Wing in 2000, they still had some thin wire and somebody rolled a chair over it. And of course, you, oh. if, we all, if you remember back to that networking, right, you cut that thing and the whole, the whole kick caboodle goes down. Right. Um, Tucking rings and, down. And so that was my first introduction to the fact that, you know, I just assumed like many people, I'm going to walk in the White House. It's going to be like a movie set. It's going to be, it's going to be gold plated. And it wasn't. And, and of course, and the reasons are no different than what all of us have seen private sector and other places. It's a busy place, right? Yeah. So when is it convenient to take down the White House network for maintenance? Never. Well, never. <laughs> when is it okay to bring work people in to try and pull wires in the West Wing? <laughs> well, there, other than like, there's like, a, if you ever watch, watch every year in August, typically when Congress is out of session, usually the president will leave for a couple of weeks vacation. It's almost like a starting line. You will have hundreds of maintenance people and staff literally waiting and the second they have go, they rush into the West Wing and East Wing and everywhere, and they will spend, literally, they'll work 24 hours. They'll do multiple shifts to try and get every piece of maintenance you could possibly do done in that couple of week window. Um, and certainly that came in place for us for IT, because as soon as they're back, it's done. You're not getting back in for another 11 months. That's your Hollywood and, movie right there, your script, Max. Yeah. And so that was a big part, um, you know, and again, look, at the White House, you get these political people in, they're typically younger. You know, that was back when I didn't have all this gray hair and they're working like crazy. They're, I mean, they're working, you know, a, a regular day for an average Joe, like for a career fed at White House is often 10 or 12 hours a day. Most of the political people, they're doing six, sometimes seven days a week, right? And because they're there on a clock and so they're gonna get done everything they can get done while they're at the White House before they go. And so they're working nonstop. So, you know, windows for patching, windows for that, um, you know. And of course, then when the president, and so I did some work when the president used to travel. So we would do the travel support. Um, and when I was there, we actually, so I, when they went overseas, either I or one of my team members would actually travel with them so we could make sure stuff is up and running, right? Because you would, and when at a presidential site, this isn't a big secret, but when the president's at a hotel, they'll have multiple floors, you'll build out a whole temporary office space for the White House, the traveling White House. Wow. I'm, I'm talking, you know, you'll have six or seven rooms with four or five computers, printers, everything, right? And so that's a huge setup. Um, you know, our friends at the White House military office do a lot of the real work for that. Uh, but we would be there as the on-site person to make sure that worked, right? And so they're running, you know, they're out doing stuff all day on a presidential trip. Then they come back. And then that's just the beginning because then everybody's working four to six hours into the night. You know, they're updating the notes, they're prepping for the next day, all that kind of thing. And you may be 10 or 12 hours off from DC, right? So I'm calling people, you know, you know, in the middle of the night at all hours, trying to get things going. Um, you know, and I, back then when I was going in single, that was tremendous fun, right? It's just, you don't see that pace anywhere else. And you're trying to keep people safe because very often you're in an adversarial environment. You're in another country that is at best a frenemy, if not an outright enemy of the United States. You're trying to ride on their telecommunications to get back to DC. You know, we had, and then you have these remote sites where, especially back when I was there, you know, this was, you know, 2006, 2007, you know, we had sites where you're literally bouncing stuff off satellites to get back to DC. 
um, and, and all those kind of things. And so it was just, uh, it was tremendous fun, but of course, yeah, it was really stressful. Um, and it was always about making that balance of, you know, look, there was, there's always a shortcut. You know, I had people, well, look, I just want to go sit in the hotel lobby on my laptop on Wi-Fi to do this because it's easier. Well, I get that's easier, but literally the guy sitting next to you is a foreign intelligence officer. And the people running the Wi-Fi in that hotel, it literally, they probably got a guy just sitting back there looking in real time, pulling that data. Like you, you can't do that. And, you know, we, I mean, we literally used to, you know, we would literally physically pull the Wi-Fi chips out of laptops we got um, to make sure people didn't do it. Like we, we would physically, not only in software, we would physically disable those devices um, to protect people. And it, and it was hard, right? Because I wanted people to get their work done. They're so busy. Um, they're doing really important work serving the president. Um, but you also have to protect them sometimes from themselves. Um, and that, that was always just such a unique balance trying to do that. Um, so yeah, the, the White House was pretty incredible. And, you know, and as you mentioned, I've worked on multiple conventions. So I've gotten to watch that technology advance. You know, I remember in 04 was sort of the first time we gave Blackberries out to people. Um, you know, iPhones had just come out in 08 when we had the convention there. And, and so watching, and I, in 04 in New York was the first time we'd ever streamed video, right? And, you know, and you flash forward to 2020, everything was streamed, the whole thing. Um, you know, there wasn't a part that wasn't basically made for streaming. Now that was COVID partly, but we've been working toward that for many years. And so um, the, the conventions are, you know, the conventions are unique and they're nice because um, to some degree with a convention, um, they're tailor-made for the cloud, right? You're standing up in office, a temp what you know is a temporary office, and then you, you're working out of there for a year, and then you're going to basically move for two months to an entirely new facility. Um, so uh, conventions, in my mind, were just tailor-made for the cloud. Um, we did a lot of work on that, which, we, you know, so when we moved to, you know, telework, that was actually really easy for us this year because, basically our whole infrastructure was essentially made to move. Um, and my team had really done a good job of finding tools like, you know, cloud printing options and, and some other things like that. Um, so they really made it easy for us to, to work remotely very quickly because our whole setup was based on that. Um, so we were very fortunate. Um, and of course, because I'm setting up new things for every convention, um, I don't have to deal with legacy hardware. So literally probably one of the single hardest jobs for any CIO which is dealing with legacy legacy systems and networks, and I don't have to deal with them because I don't have any legacy. I'm starting from scratch. So I, I will say that's as a CIO, that is one part I enjoyed of the convention is um, not having the, the terrible problem of um, you know of dealing with legacy systems. But I still had shadow IT and all the other things that we all get when we you know when we're in any enterprise or environment. As you looked yeah. at BlackBerry or any of those other technologies, was it was it competitive? Was BlackBerry like, hey, we need this and this is the next generation type thing, or were there naysayers of looking at other technologies that that were that were out there at the time? I was trying to think what Palm Palm Pilots were out at I think at that time as well. But uh, I had a few. I still had a few people running around with the Palm Pilot in 04. But yeah, I mean, if you remember back in 04, BlackBerry, you know, those have been out a couple of years, and uh, and I was in DC, and believe me, in DC, when BlackBerry first started coming out, that was like a privilege thing, yeah. right? The, the first person to get a BlackBerry was you know, and then you can imagine the when when the color screens came out for Blackberries. I, I mean, it was listen. The IT people were the most popular people in town. You know, when when color screens came out on the Blackberry, yeah. you had everybody coming over trying to like you know kiss up to you because everybody wanted to have that color screen on the Blackberry. Um, you know, that was one of the, the few times everybody actually loved the IT people because when they tried <laughs> to get those. So we um, and and I think to your point, that was really you you would see the, the demand would push it like everything, right? In 08, iPhone had just come out. So we still had Blackberries, you know, no one was really like clamoring for iPhone. Yeah. By 2012, like uh, Blackberry wasn't even a thought. It was iPhone or bust. Yeah, right. um, now we did go back and forth, you know, we used some, uh, we tried some Microsoft devices before. Um, we had tried some, uh, you know, we did some Androids and we had some people who loved the Android. Yeah. Um, you know, but even that was a good example of as, as people were used to a certain technology, um, right, a commodity commercial technology, they expect it in their, they expect it in their corporate environment. 
operate right. the same way. Yeah. And yeah. then you got to lock it down with way more, like you said, you get, you go overseas, those things better not be having any, any Bluetooth on them at all, where somebody's going to sniff, sniff that signal. Right. I mean, yeah. And I wasn't there, but I know, you know, at the white house, president Obama really wanted an iPad. And I, I can only imagine what those guys had to go through to sort of get that locked down. But, but that was his expectation. And you know what? Now, a, he's president of the United States. He's allowed to have whatever expectation he wants, but B, it was totally realistic for him to have that expectation, yeah. right? And so, you know, yeah, it doesn't have to be protected the same way as a private citizen. Um, you know, again, that was one of my little much rehashed jokes when I was at Energy, but this is 100% true. I would walk in and when I would see new employees come in, like the politicals or other people that are recent hires, especially younger hires, they'd get a laptop and they'd be there a week. And when you went by their laptop, you'd see smudges all over the screen because they all expected it to be touchscreen and it wasn't. Right? <laughs> you know, we have these three or four year old yeah. laptops and they're all like, they're almost dented the screen. Like why is my touchscreen not working? Trying to swipe. <laughs> but they expected it. It's, it's what they use at home. It's what they see. It's what everybody else does. And so um, that's a, it's a challenge and an opportunity for, you know, for CIOs and technical folks is um, let's get the right things in their hand, right? Because they have, pretty, you know, mostly reasonable expectations, at least in that realm to do it. But we have to do it in a way that protects them because of course, most of them are not protecting themselves at home, right? They're not using two-factor authentication. They're not, you know, they're not patching, right? They're not doing the things that we all know are just the, the baseline prerequisites for protecting yourselves. Um, and so that was, that's always a bit of a challenge for them is, well, we can't quite do it the same way in an enterprise because they're just going to steal your identity. They might steal a million dollars from us, or they might steal all of our intellectual property if they get in here. And it's a little bit different. Did you get any starstruck opportunities like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or anything like that, where you were able to either share in some conversations potentially, or, uh, you know, again, from a technology, it could be technology or it could be other, you know, it could be sports or something else, but any, any starstruck type opportunities, just having the opportunity, right. Of being at the white house, you know, well, I did, you know, I've gotten a few, like uh, Eric Schmidt, who was obviously former CEO of, of Google. Actually, in 2008, I got to give him a tour of the building oh, uh, cool. right before the convention. That was pretty funny. Good talking to him. Obviously, he's a, um, got some very unique perspectives and has been in the middle of, you know, one of the biggest growing companies on the planet. Um, so I think that was pretty unique. Um, we, I've gotten to work with a lot of the big tech companies over the years uh, for conventions, certainly. And so those have been fun because you get some really good people. Um, and you get to see some of their cutting edge stuff, you know, so I've gotten to go out to Google and Redmond and, and see some of their cool things as we, as we look to find some things to make the conventions a little more sexy. Um, I think those were probably, you know, the biggest ones um, that we would typically see, um, you know, and then those were ones I enjoyed, but and you got to work with just really good technical people who are very driven, um, you know, and certainly in government, you know, government doesn't pay well but you get some really dedicated people who make a lot out of a little. Yeah. Um, and I always enjoyed that. I think that was a big one for me, um, you know, but it's funny and, you know, and I, I used to run, you know, all, I used to run like all the support folks who would go over in the West Wing. And so when they would bring someone in who was gonna do any support in that environment, they would literally bring them in and sit down. I would sit them down, right? And I would walk them through a little speech and just talk to them about, you know, and, and I used to wait tables, so I'm, I'm big on, on customer service, yeah. you know, and I've literally, I've hired people before because I saw they had, they were a waiter on their, you know, they waited tables. I've hired people because of that, because I know having done that for a while, pay for law school, there are people who do, they can juggle multiple things. They understand the value of customer service. Um, and as I used to joke, you know, when you're, when you're in the West Wing, you get called over there and you might be staying in the middle, all of a sudden there's, you know, President, senators, like, I mean, you know. Starstruckness, yeah. You yeah, don't want to say anything stupid. <laughs> yeah, and you don't. And I said, but more importantly, I said, when you're waiting tables, like, did you ever have somebody who got engaged? You, you know, now I wasn't at a great restaurant. Not people, not many people came and got engaged at Chili's. Uh, but Birthdays. Yeah, but you know, there's a birthday. There's an I love you. There's a whatever. And I said, a good waiter knows, like, you don't walk up and say, one another iced tea while somebody's having a, an intense conversation. And I said, you got to have that same mindset. You learn how to be like a waiter. You have to read the, read the table. Hey, these guys are going to come. I'm just going to sit here and be, I'm either going to step out of the room or I'm going to sit here and be quiet. And I'm going to know which is which. 
and I'm simply going to wait for my opening, right? I'm not going to go reach across the table, you know, while two people are looking at each other moonstruck, right? And it's, uh, those were the kind of things that, you know, that were so important in that environment and the people who really did well, they got that. They knew when to be quiet. They knew when to talk. They knew when to just stand there and not say a word. And they probably saw some stuff and they knew when to keep their mouth shut. Um, you know, I, I had a few of them I can't share that were, you know, you're in the room or somebody did something and it's just like, we, we just got it fixed and we're never going to tell another living soul about it. But uh, and I've, I've gotten yelled at by my share of important people. Um, that, that's probably helpful now because when I was a Department of Energy, I got, you know, I went up and testified before Congress twice oh, wow. um, on, on, on our cybersecurity at the department and then for a joint hearing on a big cybersecurity program. And, and, and I, I went in the first one and, you know, they murder boarded me and everything. And I was like, it's fine. And it, they kind of looked at me like, all right, whatever. And I, and I went in and I was, and I laughed because one of the other people getting, who was testifying and who was brand new in their job, they had like papers everywhere. They were surrounded by people. I was just kind of shooting the breeze, not because I was so cool, but I knew what they wanted. And again, I sort of laughed because I was like, look, I, I had done my, I'd done my legwork before the hearing. But also I was like, listen, I've gotten yelled at by, you know, I've gotten yelled at by presidents, members of Congress, right? I, I've gotten yelled at by some pretty important people. So that that part sort of doesn't phase me anymore. Um, we have the easy button in IT, right? You get that magic button, you just turn yeah. it on. I mean, that's, you know, you've got yeah. all the power, right? <laughs> yeah. And so that that was stuff that I think helped me as well. And it and it's helped me, you know, I had to have hard, listen, I had to have hard conversations and fights with people, you know, even at the White House about cybersecurity. Um, and I, I had one particular fight with a, a very senior political person who wanted to go to a play, you know, they wanted to go to China and bring a laptop. Oof. And I was yeah, like, no. absolutely not. And I mean, I went to the mattress on it. It went up pretty high in the West Wing and I won. Um, but I was like, I'm, I'm not backing down off this. This is like, like, I listen, I will literally, I can get somebody to courier a laptop and you can go to the embassy and do it. They said, but I'm not letting you walk into China. I mean, this was back in 2008 with a laptop, you know, into China. Like yeah. this is, it's crazy. You know, of course, that was when we were all just finding out that the Chinese had hacked the McCain and Obama campaigns back in 08. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, so I've, I've had to have some of those. And of course there's, there's cyber security fights I lost. And there was ones where discretion was the better part of valor. And I, you know, I either found a better way to do it or acquire, or I, or I accepted risk. I said, okay, this is as much as I can do. Everybody knows this is a risk on the table, right? And you know what? Sometimes they were right. Sometimes, sometimes the, the executive made a decision that this is a risk we're taking. And they were right about it. You know where's what? that where's that bad battery back back, back <laughs> pack that we got to put in there that only gives you like two minutes right and just turns off cold so yeah <laughs> um, but yeah that was some of them I that really were great takeaways for me uh, from that time at the White House that um, were really invaluable and and have helped me since then as I've dealt with people and you know whether it's a Department of Energy and clients and folks that um, that have really helped me and, and it's helped me have a good perspective on you know, on cybersecurity as I, as I talk to other people and clients. Well, as we come up on the top of the hour, Max, we'd love to have you back on. And uh, I'd love to maybe specialize a session on the sausage making, the behind the scenes stuff that, you, you know, we as normal everyday citizens don't really see. Uh, I know uh, uh, during the most recent and every inauguration, when the, the changeover in the White House happens, seemingly while the inauguration is happening, I was, you know, carpets replaced, drapes are done and furniture's moved in and out. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see that chaos. It'd be fun to watch. But uh, Max, thanks so much for being on the program uh, really uh, enjoyed it uh, as usual the time has flown by and uh, welcome uh, welcome to Charlotte uh, great to have you here and uh, Mike I'll turn it back over to you yeah Max is there anything uh, enjoy the conversation today. is there anything that you'd like to plug or promote before we close today's show uh, well obviously you know I'm, I'm glad to be here in Charlotte and I'm Lord willing that vaccinations and stuff will push forward very quickly so we start to get back closer to real life um, so I'm, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking forward to being more engaged here in Charlotte. Uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, right now I'm doing consulting. I've got a, a longtime mentor uh, and friend uh, who's part of Ad Novum. And so we're, we're working with some other folks doing, you know, consulting. Most of ours is really around it's cyber risk management um, in, in IT modernization, because we, we did a lot of that in the Department of Energy and had some good success. And we, and again, I think that those two really go hand in hand. 
right? If you're, if you're doing one well, you're in the other one well, um, I think you can really push organizations forward. So that's a lot of what we work on and um, happy to have conversations with people. Yeah, it's complex, right? It's a balancing act. And if you move one, sometimes it's the chain domino chain, right? You got to be able to know how to kind of get in there. Like you said, triage and fig- figure things out on your feet, right? So um, a fun, fun place to be. So we'll put that in the show notes, uh, how folks can get in, get in, t- in contact with you, uh, potential yeah. clients or, or prospects. And again, we'd love to have you on again, get on the show. There's uh, some great uh, some stories that we've, we've, we've started here, but uh, welcome to Charlotte and uh, look forward to hopefully maybe seeing you in person here sometime soon. That'd be great. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye.